She's very much. You guys ready? Seven o'clock. We're ready. All right. Then I'd like to call the meeting, the June 17, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board. The board. The board will consider tonight's agenda in the following order: approval of the minutes from the May 22nd Planning Board meeting, followed by the Robinson Woods two. Canter Lane Resource Protection Permit Extension. Number three on the list of the BOLUS, Rosewood Subdivision Amendment, followed by the Thomas Memorial Library Expansion Renovation Site Plan, followed by public comment on items not on tonight's agenda, followed by adjournment. So first item, approval of the minutes. Did anyone have any comments, concerns, questions about the minutes? Would anyone like to make a motion on those minutes? Sure. Thank I'll you. make a motion to approve them. Second. Second. Joe, thank you. Um, any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, um, then all those in favor? Okay, that was unanimous, and the minutes have passed. Okay. <clears throat> Next item would be the Robinson Woods 2 Cantor Lane Resource Protection Permit Extension. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust is requesting a one-year extension of a resource protection permit granted last year to install wetland and water crossings and improve and install trails in the RP1, RP1 buffer, and RP2 wetlands located on Robinson Woods 2 and at the end of Morgan Lane. The extension request is filed in compliance with section 19-8-3A1H resource protection performance standards. Now, um, this application is a little different because it is on our consent agenda, meaning if a board member wants to have a discussion on this, would have to come off the consent um, made through a motion. So at this time, does anyone wish to bring this off the consent agenda? No, seeing no one then, um, then would anyone like to make a motion? Thank you, Joe. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the request submitted by the applicant, the request by the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust for a one-year extension of a resource protection permit granted last year to install wetland and water crossings and improve and install trails in the RP1, RP1 buffer and RP2 wetlands located on the Robinson Woods 2 uh, parentheses shore road and at the end of Morgan Lane be approved as a consent agenda item. Subject to the conditions placed on the original approval and repeated below. One, that the applicant consider trail surface hardening and other methods when the trail surface becomes muddy to avoid erosion. And two, that the applicant obtain a floodplain permit from the code enforcement officer. Do we hear a second? second. Thank you, Carol Ann. Um, any discussion on that? All those in favor? And that is unanimous also. I, I just want to um, note that um, we did receive a letter from the, the land trust and they said the reason they're asking for this one year extension is that our natural resource protection permit from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection is still under review. So that is why they're asking for that extension. Okay. Next item on the agenda is the BOLUS Rosewood Subdivision Amendment. And this will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide an overview of the item after which the applicant will summarize the subdivision amendment application. The public is then welcome to comment on the amendment. After public comment, the board may begin discussion, concluding with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen. Sure. When this was before the planning board as a workshop, it was discussed as a consent agenda item, and I just didn't want you to be surprised that it's not listed in the consent agenda, but there are limits to what you can put on a consent agenda. There are five criteria that you cannot put on a consent agenda, and one of them is any reduction in a buffer. Therefore, this is being presented to you as a formal amendment to the subdivision. So this is the Rosewood subdivision. It was approved in the 1990s. Included in the approval was a note that uh, there could be no removal of vegetation outside the building or clearing envelopes. The applicant has requested to remove two dead and diseased trees, and that would constitute an amendment to the original approval because you're altering the buffer. So what I have done for you is done a review of this amendment request under the subdivision standards. Okay. Thank you. John, you have a presentation? 
Thank you. My name is John Mitchell of Mitchell and Associates, and I represent Chris and Jane Bolas. Um, this is an amendment, as Maureen said, this is an amendment to a previously approved uh, Rosewood subdivision. Uh, Rosewood is a five lot subdivision that was approved in 1992. It's located between um, Mitchell Road, Woodland Road, and Elmwood Road in the northern part of the town. Uh, Chris and Jane reside at 60 uh, Elmwood Drive or Elmwood Road. This is a, an enlargement of their lot, and um, I've delineated the, uh, the building envelope as well as the clearing envelope. Um, the trees in question are outside of the building envelope. Um, there are approximately 24 plus uh, mature trees, predominantly red maple. Um, however, there are two, uh, two trees that are very unhealthy. They've lost their top half of the, uh, the crown. Um, and they continue to decline and they're very vulnerable to disease and insect, uh, as well as they're susceptible to uh, blowdown. So um, with that, um, the applicant is requesting that we remove these two trees. Uh, this is a, a very dense uh, canopy of trees, and removing the two trees will not have a substantial effect on the, uh, the buffer to adjacent properties. So. Thank you. Can I um, ask a quick question? Sure. You said this is a dense canopy. Are the trees, are there more trees than what you've shown here? There, there are more trees uh, in this area here, which um, I haven't okay. uh, located on the plan. You should have received in your in the cover letter. You, I included some photographs yeah, that show the that. two the two disease trees. Um, I do want to. Um, if anyone from the public would like to speak, so I'm just going to at this moment ask: Is there anyone here that wanted to speak on this item? No. Does the board have any questions for the applicant? We did have a workshop. We did see the photos. Um, it was very clear. One tree is already considered by the code enforcement officer to be dead, and that one, if not already taken down, will be taken down. And we saw the photos of the other trees. It was very clear. Um, there's a long trunk, nothing on the top. Yeah. Uh, for that reason, that's what I saw, and I'm willing to approve this. Anyone else have any other comments or questions for the applicant? No, then at this time, would anyone like to make a motion? Thank you, Carolyn. Motion for the board to consider findings of fact. Christopher and Jane Bullis are requesting amendment to the previously approved Rosewood subdivision to remove two trees located in an area outside the building and clearing envelopes, which is part of the subdivision buffer. The trees have lost their crowns and are declining in health. Removal of the trees constitutes an amendment to the approved buffer for the Rosewood subdivision and requires review under section 16-2-3 of the subdivision ordinance. With removal of two trees, the remaining trees and other vegetation complies with, complies with the buffer standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 16-3-1. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Christopher and Jane Bullis to amend lot five of the previously approved Rosewood subdivision located at 60 Edgewood Road to remove two trees located in an area outside the building and clearing envelopes be approved. Do I hear a second? Thank you, Joe. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Once again, that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, number four, the next item on our agenda is the Thomas Memorial Library expansion renovation site plan. The town of Cape Elizabeth is requesting site plan review of the Thomas Memorial Library addition. 
and a renovation located at 6 Scott Dyer Road. The application will be reviewed for compliance with section 19-9 section site plan regulations. And this item will be addressed in the following format. The town planner will provide a summary of the project, after which the applicant will present the project. The public is then welcome to comment on completeness of the project, after which the board will determine completeness. The public is then welcome to come back and comment on the project itself. After public comment, the board may begin discussion, concluding with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, would you please provide us with an overview? Certainly. Um, as you probably all know, the current Thomas Memorial Library is located in the Town Center Zoning District. Uh, the library is a permitted use in the Zoning District. The Town Center District does have design standards, and the board has asked this applicant to make sure they address those, and I'm sure you'll be discussing them. Uh, the library is located on the school campus, which is a very large lot, and the site plan is really focusing on only the area where the library is located. Uh, it should be noted uh, that the school campus is the subject of a DEP site location permit. So when there are alterations, the DEP permit has to be amended. Um, however, there are some new provisions that you can alter, I believe it's up to 30,000 square feet, without having to go back and formally amend your DEP site law permit. And I believe the applicant is working through that process. So there may not be the need for uh, state permits, and the applicant's going to work through that. The w one last thing I want to make sure the board understands is there is a separate building on the site called the Spurwing School, which is currently part of the library. The applicant is not proposing anything in that building at this time. So for the purposes of staff review, it's been treated as storage, and we are not uh, assigning any parking requirement to that building. Thank you. Would you like to make a presentation at this time? Great. Thank you. I'm Molly McCausland. I'm the chair of the Library Building Committee. Thank you all for having us this evening. <clears throat> Before we give our presentation, I'd like to give you just a really brief presentation on some of the work that's been done in planning for this project over the last few years. The town does have a history of um, updating and upgrading the library facilities approximately every 20 years. and um, our most recent renovation was done in 1985, so we're a little bit overdue. It's been about 30 years since the last renovation project was done. In February of 2013, the council charged the Library Planning Committee with, library, with planning for library programs and services for the upcoming 25-year period. And the Planning Committee used a multifaceted approach for gathering public input and ideas about the future of the library and the community. The committee met with the Town Center Planning Committee, considered opportunities for reuse and renovation of the existing facilities at the TML, explored the use of um, other town-owned facilities, and eventually decided that a very carefully designed combination of renovation and new construction was the best choice for meeting the needs of the town for the future in the library. The committee selected the design team of Reed & Company, a Maine-based firm with extensive library renovation experience to assist us with the project. And based on a careful assessment of the possibilities and out of a desire to both respect the past and to plan adequately for the future, the planning committee and Reed & Company recommended to the council that the Pond Cove Annex Building, that's that part of the library that fronts on Scott Dyer Road, should be preserved, and that a new addition should replace the 1985 connector. In January of this year, though, the council also appointed a library building committee and charged this group with implementing the recommendations of that planning committee, including designing and pricing an approximately 16,000 square foot project at a budget of not to exceed $4 million. While our design team will be presenting the project to the planning board this evening, the building committee and the design team are still working out the details of the building interior. And in August, the building committee will be presenting the final project to the council for its approval. With the council's approval, the project will go to referendum in November for final approval by the voters. And once that voter approval is received, the building committee is anticipating that construction will commence in January of 2015. We're excited about the project. And we look forward to hearing your comments. And at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Dick Reed to introduce the members of the design team.
Good evening. Uh, with me tonight is Cynthia Lobenstein from Reed & Company Architecture, and Eric Duby from Casco Bay Engineering, who is our civil engineer, and Peter Beagle from design, uh, Land Design Solutions, our landscape architect. Um, Eric is going to lead the presentation uh, with the site plans. Great. Thanks, Dick. As the civil engineer, I get to have all the fun. So, um, so my name is Eric Duby. I am um, co-owner of Casco Bay Engineering. I'm an engineer, civil engineer, and planner. And um, I was fortunate enough to uh, be involved in a project. Dick and Cynthia had uh, given me a call, and it was, uh, it was great to hear it. I love working on projects like this. This is right up our alley. So, um, so I just want to start off with that. We came here initially for... Um, for a workshop to describe our basic layout and plan set and, and what our intentions were. Our uh, design has changed a little bit, but not a lot. We've, uh, we really thought we hit it on the mark with our first design and layout. Um, we did some additional work based on that workshop meeting um, as far as boundary survey and getting some of those points nailed down because we're tight on setbacks, um, especially with parking and what our dimensional requirements are for that um, with the village standards. So, um, so we're able to do that and I, I, we feel that we're in a very good place. We've had many meetings with the committee and uh, all of us are on the same page at this point. So, so I just want to go through a brief introduction and I'm going to hand it over to the landscape architect, uh, Peter Beagle, to talk about uh, the, uh, the big pieces of the, the landscaping. So, as we can see here, um, as Molly just describes, we have the existing uh, annex building out front, and then we have the connector building that's shown here, um, and then uh, we basically have the, uh, uh, the school that's, um, that's in the rear, it's gonna remain. And essentially what our plan is, is to remove this, which is shown on our demolition plans, but this area, in the rear and leave the existing other two buildings. And as we can see, I'll go through existing a little bit more. So we have existing water lines. We have existing parking that's essentially a dead end parking situation for everyone that's familiar with this. Um, and it's a double loaded uh, corridor. And then we have this, which is essentially striped to have access to the neighboring property because this uh, access way was closed off a number of years ago. We have, of course, the existing elementary school that's in the uh, rear, uh, or I'll say on the, um, in that case, the west side. And we have an existing fire lane that basically comes down and moves into the playground area, which is what this is. This is a sloping area that's out back. And then Right now we have the sewer line that essentially serves existing buildings, the three existing buildings, and then that ties into and then uh, basically goes off to a, uh, another catch basin sewer manhole that's located um, on the other side of the school. Our intention is to leave these connections here and we'll show that um, in a proposed and then we, uh, one of the comments was this sewer line that we were originally um, uh, going to leave we're going to actually move that around our new building so so in our proposed site we try to use hatching to our advantage so we can show where the uh, we're going to repave the new parking lot we're going to show that and the new building so the new building as you can see the outline is shown here at the attached to the existing building out front we have basically an alleyway through here that we're going to be able to utilize with landscaping and the uh, children's garden and area out back with a uh, new paved parking, uh, I'm sorry, new paved pathway. That pathway that is existing here is going to essentially be removed and is going to be relocated uh, to this section over here. We also have an existing access way pathway that's out front that is going to be moved to the north of the existing building with essentially a, a patio area that'll be on the front side of the building. The existing sidewalk, where, and again, these are all gonna be new materials. Uh, this will be a, a concrete sidewalk uh, access way that's similar, and then we're gonna merge that into that, um, 
the entryway that's on the east side of the building, uh, the new addition. And then that's also going to um, connect over um, into the Spurwing School. And uh, then again, we're going to have a patio that's here and then a connector to the side. We are going to be removing a piece of this building on the side of the building, um, which basically connects into a stairway, an access way. Um, so we're working with grading and everything else to keep that to uh, basically get to um, handicap accessible. As you can see here, what we've done is uh, the, we've left the shape of the existing parking because we need, again, this access way to remain open. So we, this is exactly the same access way to the neighboring property that we've had before. We've kept um, parking spaces in here and we've kept parking spaces. We've relocated handicapped spaces to basically be in this area. And we've dropped this entire area um, down to a lower level so we don't have to deal with just one ramp. So basically we have a ramp on this side, ramp on this side, and ramp on this side, and then it's a lower. We felt that was going to work better um, with the, because we needed um, four spaces versus just two spaces on that. We also have a sidewalk connector that uh, connects to uh, the back road over here. Forget me, I'm going to hold that up higher. And we, uh, and that's going to connect across. We've basically um, taken our throat width of this drive and narrowed it down. One, to slow people down coming through here um, so that when they, uh, they can see that it's narrower and they'll uh, automatically slow down. And then we have the crosswalk that extends across here with, again, a, uh, a ramp. And then we have granite curbing that essentially extend, extends all the way around here with uh, a couple of drop-off spots uh, that can be used for either drop-off or they can be used for deliveries when we need the, uh, or have the need for that. We have a couple landscaping islands per the ordinance that we're, we're looking for. Um, for. Plus, we're trying to break up the parking area. And then we've, again, we've extended it to meet uh, all of our five-foot setbacks in this area here with some leftover parking over in this, uh, or uh, some future parking or, or um, basically during events, um, it's um, extra parking that, when we need it. So we've met, again, the, the setbacks as we've needed. With the parking in general, We've, as you can see by the, uh, by the calculations, from what we need for the, uh, in the parking requirements, and that was in the parking calculations, which was section F, um, the total number of spaces that were required for this site is 37, and what we've required on this site is 53. So um, we've met the parking standard and requirement on this, and we have some additional parking. Um, for overflow and, and for other events, so um, we felt that was a good solution for what we were um, what we were trying to achieve with that. So beyond that, uh, we've essentially left the Joan Benoit Samuelson um, alone out front and are not altering that in any way. Um, the existing, uh, I'm sorry, the proposed utilities are going to tie into the new building similar to what they uh, are now. The existing electrical transformer is over in this area. We're going to be, we're going to utilize that in the new design. As I mentioned with the sewer, we're actually going to add, uh, it was one of the comments that we'd received from the AMEC review. We're going to take care of, um, we're going to address all those comments, but specifically one of the comments was talking about relocating the sewer line around the building, and that's, um, that's easy enough for us to do. So we've already incorporated that into our, um, into our next submittal. I've been working on that in the last, um, last week or so. I'm going to let Peter talk about um, the landscaping portion. He's got a beautiful drawing and does a much better job than I do at that. Um, but I think, for the most part, that addresses, that addresses what our intentions are. And after Peter gives a uh, presentation about landscaping and, I, and we talk a little bit more about the building, we're happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.
Good evening. My name's uh, Peter Beagle. I'm with uh, Land Design Solutions, and as Eric said, I'm the, uh, the landscape architect on the uh, design team. Uh, Eric gave uh, pretty good overall, but the, the landscape issues that I'd uh, like to cover um, following the, uh, the ordinance uh, format would be talking about the uh, front setback, which would be between the library and Scott Dyer Road. Uh, this area. It's, uh, our, our goal was to take what was there and it's, it's actually quite welcoming as it is. It has the nice uh, existing trees and the existing trees we show is these the dark green spots. So those are the existing trees out there. We keep those and we don't uh, touch the uh, John Benoit Samuelson area right there. Uh, the lawn area looks great but what we have done is we have lined the sides uh, to give us a little enclosure so we're not bleeding into the, uh, the fire lane service road over here. When you go out there today, it seems like one bleeds into the other. And so we've uh, planted, uh, spaced these uh, small flowering ornamental trees uh, in these two rows to give ourselves, uh, close our lawn in a little bit, provide a little uh, vertical element for uh, visual purposes and give our uh, nice little lawn area some enclosure. And so we've done that on both sides. Uh, we've also, uh, planning on keeping the existing sign, which is right here. Uh, but there are a couple unruly shrubs down there, and we would get rid of those and put in a nice uh, new plant bed around the existing sign and provide a uh, little uh, bench for seating here, which could serve people walking down the sidewalk along Scott Dyer or people that are just hanging out on the uh, uh, lawn area. Uh, we're providing a little uh, plaza area in front of the library. could be used for multiple, uh, multiple purposes. As we move around the building into the parking area, um, we have a requirement of a five foot wide uh, landscape esplanade around the parking. And that would be right along here and right along here. And we've incorporated some, small, uh, some of the smaller uh, flowering ornamental trees with a variety of evergreen and deciduous shrubs bearing heights. Uh, we've incorporated a few uh, tough uh, hardy perennials. Uh, not having a lot of room, it's a little limited as to uh, what we can do in there, but we've provided a pretty full, pretty full shrub bed along there and a pretty full shrub bed along uh, uh, Holman Road. Again, these dark trees are existing trees that are to remain. Uh, so we've sprinkled in some uh, larger uh, deciduous trees uh, along here to help uh, uh, keep that uh, buffer, some buffer and some canopy, giving some separation between, uh, between us and uh, Holman Road. Um, the shrubs that are planted along here are a little bit, a little bit larger to help provide that uh, a screening, buffering feeling. Uh, we've been, uh, so we move uh, through the, uh, the parking lot islands, all have uh, trees and uh, trees and shrubs uh, underneath the trees. Um, we've used uh, mulch, the, the lower, the tall tree, shrub and mulch. Uh, no grass there just for tree health purposes, trying to provide as much uh, or the less competition uh, for moisture uh, um, as we can. So that was uh, better for the uh, tree help. Um, we have this area right here, uh, the reading garden, which is meant for all users of the library or, or public users to be able to come into a municipal space, bring your magazine, your newspaper, take a book out, um, sit on the benches that are in here. Uh, you're in a beautiful little landscape area, some beautiful shrub beds around you, sit there and read or think or talk or whatever you want to do. It's just a great municipal uh, space for people to come out here and, and have a little uh, time for themselves and read away and take advantage of it. Um, we go down to this area and this is a uh, discovery, family discovery space is what we've called that. It's for uh, uh, parents and young kids to be able to go out here from the library. There's a, uh, a, a fence that goes around here, low fence that encloses that so it's secure. Um, there is a gate, but the gate is, uh, is, is locked. Uh, so you only access that from, from inside. Parents can go in there with their kids. There'll be some, um, call them activity areas, where maybe some sand, and, and it's for kids to explore. There's some child-size uh, furniture that will be out there. So. Um, anyway, we're calling that the family, uh, 
discovery space, and there'll be some neat things for uh, parents to take to do with their uh, young children. And that would really be the extent of the uh, landscape. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to briefly describe the function of the building, and Cynthia is going to talk about the sort of the, the materials and the aesthetics of the building as it relates to the town center ordinances. This is a demolition plan, and you can, if it were clearer, you could see that the the, the uh, 1985 connector uh, is being demol being eliminated, and this is the floor plan of the upper level. The uh, Han Cove School Annex is right here. Scott Dyer wrote on this side. And this is the addition. As you probably know, the existing building is two stories. So we are entering in between two floors with a new entrance. And uh, that is at grade, handicap accessible entrance. And by way of an elevator, you, you can go to the upper level or, or down to the lower level. And the stairway going up to the circulation desk is here and the stairway going down to the lower level is here. The building breaks down into young adult areas, staff support areas, uh, adult fiction areas, periodical reading areas, and um, study carol areas. This side of the building looks down onto that discovery playground that Peter was talking about. So from, and there's a, a, a sort of a, a, a small reading area here also looking down to the lower level garden. The lower level, you could arrive at that by coming down the elevator or these stairs. This part of the existing building is, is a fairly large meeting room. These are smaller rooms that are staff support, staff spaces, janitor, really support space, and, a, and one medium-sized meeting room and a kitchen. And the central area, as you come down, is a a gallery for the display of art, public toilets, a mechanical support space, and th this entire area is the children's library with an outdoor canopy for parking strollers, and the, the discovery playground is over here. We're introducing a new stairwell at the, the, what was the former entrance to the, the school and has not been an entrance for a long time. This is a, a, a stairwell that allows light into the lower level and creates a, a facade, a window facade, on the front of the building facing Scott Dyer Road. Want me to go back? Say when. Right there. So I was going to speak a little bit to the uh, town center. Uh, district design standards, um, which include the footprint, the scale, the height, and roof pitch, the building and parking orientation, the openings and existing materials. The building orients to Scott Dyer Road and the east side where the existing parking is located. The front existing facade of the Pond Cove Annex Building is oriented to the street, although the primary entrance is located on the side, and that's mainly because of accessibility issues and the proximity to parking. This is um, considered acceptable in the town center district. And, existing, and some of this is I'm reviewing that we've been speaking about earlier. An existing sidewalk is parallel to the front facade, and a new sidewalk connects the new entrance to the parking. Par parking is currently located on the side and will be expanded with landscaped islands with no more than 10 parking spaces in a row. The existing building footprint, the, Con the Pond Cove Annex Building, is oriented to Scott Dyer Road, and the new addition footprint is towards the south side of the site. The new building footprint mirrors the dimensions of the footprint size of the existing building. The open spaces that are a result of the new footprint form a rhythm between the existing building and the new buildings. The space created between the new addition and the existing spurring school creates a new reading garden and a visual connection through to the school playground.
So this is a rendering that we had uh, made of the front entrance of the building. It gives you an idea of some of the scale, the proportions, uh, and the materials. The new construction is compatible in scale with the other structures in the district. The articulation of the facade, the proportions of the windows, and the choice of exterior materials of the new building relate to the graceful municipal nature of the Pond Cove Annex Building. The scale of the new building is complementary to the size and scale and the features of the existing buildings. The relationship between the doors and the windows to exterior wall space of the building creates a rhythm or pattern. The proposed building has a pattern of windows or door openings which respects the relationship of opening to wall of the existing Pond Cove Annex building. The rhythm of the windows and the proportions of the openings to walls are commodious and stately. Our project generally has similar roof pitches to the existing Pond Cove Annex building, which is hipped and has a pitch of 8 and 12, exceeding the town center standard of 7 and 12. The roof material will be asphalt shingles, similar to the adjacent buildings. The height of the building does not exceed the existing Pond Cove Annex building. The proposed exterior materials are co compatible with the nearby buildings and with the design of the structure. Exterior materials are durable, long-lasting, and friendly. They include brick at the base with fiber cement clapboards to match the wood clapboards of the existing Pond Cove Annex and spurring school buildings. Other materials include granite-clad columns at the new entrance and terracotta panels. The entrances are glass storefront systems with insulated glass. The front entrance canopy is made of metal and has a copper flashing and a membrane roof. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if we got your name for our record key. Oh, Cynthia Lobenstein. Was there any other names you didn't capture? No. Thank you. Are you um, ready for the board's questions? We are. Okay. Uh, just for formality, I do have to say that I will open this up to the public, but when I look out, I see that we have <laughs> no one from the general public here. So we'll go right into uh, questions from the board. Um, was that, oh, no, actually, that was completeness. Does the board have any questions now on completeness? Anyone on completeness? I have one question. Okay. okay. Um, this piece of property is just one property that includes the school and um, the library, correct? So there's no setback issue between the school and the library? That's correct. Okay. Anyone else on questions about completeness? And if we don't have any more, did I hear a motion from someone on completeness? I, I have a question about um, completeness. So I'm wondering if you saw the um, memo from AMIC dated June 11th, which had some comments on completeness. I did. And oh, okay. I was hoping that you could address the comments of the town engineer. I'd certainly be happy to. Um, I do want him to address that. Um, okay. I almost feel that's a little beyond completeness. Do you, you want do? to? OK. Does anyone want to address this? Okay. Just to note, yes. the letter from the town engineer, the first paragraph says that, well, the engineer feels his comments are beyond the completeness level. They did? OK. Yes. I, was, I was just rereading it for that. It's been a few days since yes. I read this. Um, I do want them to address it, because there are a number of very good points that need to be addressed. OK, but, but if it's we want to get beyond so, completeness. So we address it after. And I mean, certainly you can go over every one, but I believe the applicant has already agreed to, that he will address all of them. Okay, in the great. next submission. Okay, excellent. Yeah, we don't we can't go over them anyway. Yes, we'd be happy to go over them, but basically we don't have any issues with their comments. And as I, I tried to say in my opening statement, that uh, I've already taken care of probably 90% of these comments awesome. for the Thanks. for the next submission. I'm, great. So. Appreciate it. All set. Would anyone like to make? Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application 
of the Town of Cape Elizabeth for site plan review of the Thomas Memorial Library addition renovation located at 6 Scott Dyer Road be deemed complete. We hear a second. Second. Thank you, Joe. Any discussion? All those in complete in its favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, at this point then we will discuss any questions that the board has. Um, I know I have a question, but I want to open it up to other people. Anyone else have any questions? Hi. This is beyond completeness. Yes. This is to do with... Henry, can you use your microphone, Hi. please? Uh, Hi. Um, I'm looking at the plan, and I noticed that you have a concave entrance plan, concave around the area there, which means that if a car swings around there for a while, it's actually approaching the building. It's not running parallel to the building. You're running around, headed in towards it. I noticed that there's a, the, the, the door, according to the plan, is about seven to ten feet from the curb edge. Now, this is just a point, it doesn't really make to a lot. I, my estimation is a child, because libraries tend to have children, running out of there, and a car is actually ended up by heading towards the door if it's following the line of the, the concave part of it. And so now it has to turn quite some distance to move away from possibly running into the child, whereas if it was running parallel to there, it would only have to be a 25, 30 degree turn. So I mentioned it during the workshop, and I guess it didn't come up again this time. So I wondered why you still put that concave in, if you just stretch the road to make it parallel, there's no way that, it, that a car would actually head towards the door, it would only be running parallel to the door. I, just my observation. So yeah, we did address that, and I know the discussion led, and we've had many conversations about that, but um, the basic uh, basis from a civil engineer's uh, standard on this is that there's many situations, whether it be schools or libraries, that have this situation here. I feel it to be a much safer situation than the current situation is, um, even though people feel that when they pull in, they're going to be going slow, but when they pull in. But when you pull in like that and your driver, uh, um, you're on the left-hand side of the vehicle. It's difficult to see with the other cars in front if there is somebody else approaching, or like a child or, or something there. So when you're pulling in, it can happen very quickly where somebody can run out. We're talking about a small child in You've here. You've only got 10 feet of path, 10 feet between the door and the curb. So that's correct. But quick, you've got a second and a half to react. But, well, that's at higher speeds. And again, we're narrowing the throat width of the entire... No, I'm talking about the child's speed, not the car's speed. I so... It's 10 feet, that's three paces, six, four paces. Yeah. So we feel that with the extended vision of what you have as a driver, you're going to be able to see a better view, especially with no, again, remember that it's, we're taking the parked cars out of the existing configuration, and there is a possibility to have a car out there for a drop-off, but we're basically, you have a wider opening, so you have another 10 feet in there where a drop-off spot is also going to be. So that's, that's why it's, it's a safer configuration because you have a better angle of vision and the fact um, that you're, you're going to be going, in my opinion, you're going to be going slower through that area and, and go with that. So if you have something approaching, you're going to have a much better field of vision. So, And again, this is not, so, just, just so we're clear, this is not the only situation. I mean, we've reviewed a bunch of situations with this, and you have a bunch of Schools like my middle school and my elementary school both have this exact situation, and both are schools with children that approach, and, and this is exactly the configuration. Yes. For what it's worth, this is consistent with what planning recommends for really slowing down speeds. To have a concave entry? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Yes, Peter. <coughs> Excuse me. Could you talk a little bit about the um, the restoration, uh, the magnitude of the restoration project on the existing building, the part that will not be destroyed, as opposed to the, the new structure? 
Yes. Um, on the exterior, we'll be repointing brick as needed, um, sanding flatboards and trims, and repainting the exterior. New roof, new flashings, new trims. So the exterior will be renovated pretty much as is, but in better condition. The interior has been gutted once already, uh, but we will be upgrading with uh, completely new insulation from the basement slab all the way up through to the attic. Uh, and we'd be using, it, where appropriate, spray insulation, uh, cellulose, using the right insulation for the right application. We'll be totally rewiring the building for power, lighting, technology. We'll be putting a completely new mechanical system in, uh, heating, air conditioning, ventilation. So it's a, the interior is not historic at all. It was pretty much removed in 1985, and, but we'll be bringing, um, bringing the, the 85 up to current standards and beyond. Liza. Oh, yeah, related to that question, I was curious about your um, choice of mixing two different sidings, keeping the wood on the existing building, and then upgrading to concrete. Fiber cement. Fiber cement on the back. Fiber cement is, it, for all practical purposes, will look exactly like the wood siding, but it's, uh, it's more durable. It holds paint better, basically. It's more durable. It lasts longer. So it seems like a good match to use a new and improved, and, and not that new. Fiber cement's been around a long time. We've used it on many projects, and it's, it's, it's more stable than wood, so the paint stays on it longer, basic, and you can get it pre-finished. So it seemed like the right choice for the, for the new construction. Gotcha, but, um, but not on the old. Well, we weren't going to remove the siding from the yeah. old. And, and the old building is, has a lot of, um, I think the, the clapboards may have been replaced once already. It's, they're, they're in very good shape. I think it would be wasteful to replace those. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes, sure. Uh, Dick, come on back. <laughs> Dick. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this diagram that uh, got sent out. And um, my question is, you know, when initially I looked at the plan and saw this elevation, I thought it was just a very clever and slick way to solve the issue of well, thank getting you. at Can we stop there? <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm, you know, you, with the steps there, you've got a sense of entrance into this building. Step Excuse me, the steps will not be there. Mm -hmm. The steps will not be there. The no, I know, the oh, steps okay. are going, I understand okay. that, but I'm saying that right now what you do have, even though the steps are not used, you still have a sense of entry and movement into this building off the main drag there. And you're going to lose it here. You know, it's going to become sort of impenetrable. So I... I mean, I don't, I just, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything you haven't thought no, about. And we've no. certainly struggled with that, and I think you're making a good point. I think the design challenge for that is it's not the entrance to the building. And we're trying to make a very visible side entrance, which, again, it, the town standards allow that, you know, with a canopy and signage and columns. So, um, so what do you do with something that was a former entrance? And our feeling was we make it a really spectacular window. And so that's, that's what this is trying to do, is to um, make it intentionally not an entrance, but make, because of the portico and the dormer above it and its central location uh, on the facade and its symmetrical placement of windows on each side, it's really important. So we made it a really important window. And that window allows us to get natural light down into the lower level, which is also a, you know, an important goal for, for developing the lower level as, as premium space. And there are there existing windows in back of that window? Which window? I'm sorry. The, on the uh, the new window going in. Let me just look at my elevation. What's the sheet number of that one? Uh, this one. So the, these new windows here, but in back are the existing. Those windows are behind the columns. Those existing windows. Uh, I mean, not existing windows, I'm sorry. The new windows are behind the columns, does that? Right. 
Oh, yeah, there's another layer on the interior that's glass. So all of the north facing light, um, so no glare, comes into the, both the upper and lower level. But that's not, that's all new. All new well, also. On the second right. layer on the end. Okay. Basically, we're taking what was that entrance and, and creating a stairwell at that entrance. It's a premium location for egress, for safety from the building, but it's also a great opportunity to take something that isn't an entrance anymore, make something important out of it, and then allow natural light into the building on two levels. So that, that was the challenge. So we're intentionally making it not look like a door, an entrance, but make it look like a window. That, does that answer the question? Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions over here? No, my questions were addressed by your answer to Annex letter. <laughs> okay. Did, were you, um, do you want to go through anything on the Amic letter that was particularly? Nope. Can I ask one more design question? Certainly. So, on the southwest corner, that two story uh, piece where the roof comes down a little further. Oh, yes, the sure. The, the, sort of the reading rooms? Yeah, so I was walking around and back there, and it seems like that's going to be quite prominent in the view like from the, where the kids play? Yes. Are you going to do any kind of 3D that would include the existing school and maybe that corner? That view? The... Uh, we hadn't planned on it, and we could talk to the committee about it. Right now, we're, we've uh, scheduled certain view to, to be rendered. Uh, but we have the model of that area, so we could Maybe not do the rendered, but the sort of a, a sketch-up model. It might be good for people to get an okay. idea of what, what that's that is. going to look like. It is a very work. important corner, so I agree. It's, uh, it, we've actually had a lot of fun with the reading, the, the children's place playground here. Uh, the other place, discovery space. This is the reading room, and you're looking down on that little area. So I think it's actually going to be really sweet. Yeah, oh, it's a very cool space. Joe, Joe's talking about this corner right here where we project out from the, like the footprint. Right and it, it goes around two sides. And there's, in the lower level, it's a, it's a uh, sort of a story hour nook. And in the upper level, it's a quiet reading area. All set? Yeah. OK, let's bring Peter up. You haven't been brought up yet. Your turn. <laughs> I'd like to talk buffering. Landscaping. So I am on page L1.1. I was um, looking at the standards that we have that talk about an adequate buffer, and I was looking at the buffering. And um, in the, I'm going to start with the lawn area, the um, future parking. Um, I, when I went out there, I noticed that between um, the town's property there's, and the existing building, that there's a stockade fence right there. And then I was looking at the spruce trees, and I was thinking about adequate buffer. And I was looking at this home over here that has no windows on that side of the building, just a door, a second story door. And they already have trees. And I was just thinking, that's a heavy buffer. We can't even get that kind of a buffer from people that are planting subdivisions. I mean, that's a really heavy buffer. And I was thinking, it's more than enough. Any thoughts on? Well, funny you should mention that. Uh, we did have that discussion, and we did think it would be uh, appropriate to um, remove those and replace it with, uh, uh, say, three deciduous trees there and have more of a kind of carry the deciduous tree theme, um, loop that around uh, our perimeter. So I, you'll see that on the, uh, the next uh, version. Okay. Um, and when you're, um, can I just say something about that? So I don't agree with that. I think the onus is on the applicant to provide adequate buffering. And um, just because the homeowner currently has buffering, I don't think means that that the requirement has been met. So that's my view, and I don't know how other people feel. But okay. But I would be in favor of putting deciduous trees. You have a couple of maples down in the corner. One of those maples is off of the property. I mean, it's still town owned, but any thoughts about moving that maple onto? Do you see which maple I'm speaking yeah, of that's off? Right, I was, I was kind of leaving it along. 
those trees are all um, in the right way. So I, was, I guess I was taking a little liberty and looking where, um, you kind of see where, the, when this is plowed, where the snow goes, and, and so it looked like we were safe here, and I was just trying to uh, meander the trees, if you will, versus kind of the straight line. Um, but there's no, I mean, there's no issue with sliding that onto uh, library property if that's uh, property. I just noticed it was off. Um, I'll leave that up to the um, applicant then on where to, whether or not to move that particular tree. But that, those were my thoughts. If the trees, if that maple does get moved onto this uh, lawn area, I know this is meant for future parking possibly would be paved in the future. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm just, I'm looking very long term. I, I would want that maple placed in such a way that each parking space is, uh, what is it, six, uh, 18, uh, um, whatever the space size is, that you actually would start marking out those spaces so that you put that maple in a spot where you're not taking up two spots, you just take up, you understand where I'm yes. going with that? Okay. Um, I was also looking at uh, some of the, um, the landscaping um, below those maples. I'm not sure. What, let's see. There were HR. Now on the parking islands, uh, there's some flowering underneath. Uh, right. So the, the HRs are uh, day lily. So they're either uh, they're either low shrubs or uh, and there's some uh, day lilies sprinkled in in a number of places. So there are day lilies around this uh, maple and around this maple uh, in front of the bio slash the bubble. And it is pretty, but I was thinking once again for maintaining, and I've been looking at other islands. Um, you can look right out here, and there's some islands, and, and they basically just have the tree and the mulch. And once again, I was thinking maybe this is, uh, as far as buffering goes, this doesn't really uh, apply to our adequate buffering. It, it, it is pretty, but I, I'm not sure if it's over and above. And, my comment again just for you and the applicants to discuss and that would probably be true with the crab apples the two crab apples same thing there's some underneath uh, there mm -hmm. uh, no I was thinking the crab apples that are part of the island oh, uh, yes once again there's some underneath uh, right. right okay just my thoughts on those um, and then maybe when you do come back, um, there is a, a, a buffering between the existing Spurwink school building and this lawn area. I, I, I wouldn't want to send us, uh, no, um, the other side of the Spurwink building. To the east. And the lawn area for uh, future parking. Oh. Right, right in there. Um, it, it looks bare, but it, it is a heavily buffered area, quite grown over. I don't know if you could maybe just put a cloud. I wouldn't want, don't send a surveyor out there to count the trees and, and, I, and there's a ch chain link fence. It, maybe if we could just put a cloud so that someone would know that we realize that there is the vegetation in that area, right. that it's not just grass to grass. And I think that was it on, um, on the buffering. I, th those are my thoughts, but I'd like to hear from the board. Um, I'm taking away, so I'd like to hear from the board about an adequate buffer in the commercials. Well, I won't, not necessarily buffering. I just wanted to say I, I liked the variety in your plant list. I thought it was quite interesting. Thank you. Yeah, the, to me, the buffering here, because we are in the town center zone, and we have the, the neighbors, if you will, are largely school buildings and whatnot, or commercial space, uh, I see less of a need of buffering of the sort you might want to have in subdivision. Uh, so it's something that's aesthetically pleasing and, and, and does provide some uh, screening is fine. I, I don't see the need to be as intense, and I'm almost thinking that the visual attractiveness of the buffer is almost more important here than any sense of bulk or mass in buffering. Uh, would that speak to the spruce trees against the stockade fence, that if those were removed, uh, that's the thickest buffer. I'd, I'd like the other comments. If those were removed and replaced with uh, three maples, is that what you're thinking of? Or? I, I'd have to go look at it again. I'm, I'm not visualizing what you're talking about. Okay. Just, 
once again, I'm taking away, and I just want to make sure if board members have comments to that, that they are brought out, that it's not just well, me. Well, are we going to have a sidewalk? We can vote. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, there are no spruce trees. Those are intended to be. Planted. So it's, there's nothing that would, those would be planted. So we could look at that. Yeah. But those are the comments I have. If anyone else has any other comments? Yeah, I would, uh, I'd like to encourage a sidewalk to make a discussion about buffering a little bit more. Okay. You know, if then you want to, if you want to spread it out, if you want people's comments, not everybody has taken the time to go up and, and walk the property as you have. So, okay. um, you know, I can visualize some of what you're saying, but I haven't been there in the last couple of days. So, okay. I guess you're out of the hot seat right now and we'll discuss okay. the site walk, but thank you. Thank you. thank you for answering those questions. And everyone is all set. We are ready now to discuss the site walk. All set with questions? Okay. Then, how many people would like to take a site walk? Okay. Then let's schedule a site walk. What looks good? I can do this week. I don't know what other people are what? thinking. I didn't hear. This week? I want to do an evening at the end of the workday or the you... yep. beginning of the workday? Uh, Thursday or Friday, preference, or Saturday? Um, I'd vote for Thursday. If... Are we talking beginning of the day or end of the day? I can do Thursday beginning of the day. I, yeah, I can't do beginning of the yeah, day. I can't do beginning of the day. Yes, I can do, I take that back. I can do beginning of the day this Thursday. It's not next Thursday. You cannot? Not, not real. I have a doctor's appointment at 8. I can do it at 9.30 or something. That's That's the 19th. The end of day. 19th, 8 a.m.? You can't do 8 a.m.? No, I, I cannot. What time do you but I can I can look at it separately. Don't you know I can do it all. Friday morning, 8 a.m. Yeah. That's the 20th. 7:30. Yeah. 7:30. Yeah. 7:30. Yeah. <laughs> School's out. I'm supposed to be sleeping. Uh, I'm sorry, but work ain't out. So 7:30, uh, 7 o'clock would be Does even 7 better. 7:30 work so. for people on Friday. Yeah. Henry. You got me dizzy, but okay. You can do it. Does that work for you folks? 7.30 on Friday. No? Doesn't work for my landscaper? Uh, no. Okay. My family and I are missing from Mount Cod for Thursday afternoon. Oh, got to cancel that. <laughs> what do we get for when, when are you coming back? Saturday. So the next week. The next week? I'm available Sunday. <laughs> I work seven days a week. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> the following week, what are the agenda? Uh, what do people have on their calendars? Um, I'm good Monday, Wednesday, Friday mornings. I am too, but what do other people have? Monday or Wednesday, not Friday. Could we do it early? 7.30, Now you want to go early? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Liza, how are you on those days? Um, great, at 7.30. Okay. So Wednesday, June now, 25th? how does that work for other members? Monday or Wednesday? Or even Wednesday? Wednesday? Wednesday, Did we say June, June 25th, 7.30? Yeah. Everyone's okay there? Okay. June 25th, 7.30, and that was a.m. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. You meet in the you meet in the parking lot, the library. Parking. Yes, we're going to meet in the library parking lot at 7:30 a.m. June 25th. Okay then. We've scheduled the sidewalk, and then we'd like to schedule a public hearing for next month. So, would anyone like to make a motion? Oh, Carolyn. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of the Town of Cape Elizabeth 
for site plan review of the Thomas Memorial Library addition renovation located at 6 Scott Dyer Road be tabled to the regular July 15, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing will be held. We hear a second. A second. Thank you. So, uh, okay. Any discussion of that motion? All those in favor of the motion? And passes unanimously. Thank you. So we will see you next week. Thank you very much. The next item would be public comment. And for items not on the tonight's agenda, and seeing no one, we'll move go right on to adjournment. Would anyone like to make a motion for adjournment? Motion we adjourn. Second. Thank you. Uh, discussion? All those in favor? We have adjourned. And I will note that the board will next be meeting in the Jordan Conference Room for a special workshop to update the planning board process and rules of procedure. Thank you.